And thank you, Drew. Good morning to everyone. I'm gonna ask the ladies to come up at this time. We're gonna sing a song that we've sung before in uh, Christ Alone and uh, hope that you'll join with us. It's a great song. Um, there is a ballad to this, okay? And uh, there's two places in the song. If you'll watch me, if I go like this, that means we're supposed to sing that quiet. And then when I go like this, that means we're supposed to lean back and just let it rip, okay? So uh, you watch me. This is what? Shh. Okay. And this is what? Uh, let it rip, you guys. <laughs> okay. So in the song, and I hope that as we sing this song and we get to those parts, you'll realize why we're l being so loud on the one. It's, it's supposed to be a breaking forth of our hearts in worship to our God in this great aspect of the song. So stand with me if you would, and uh, let me get the clicker out so that I can get ready to do my job. In Christ alone. Anytime you have electronics, there's always difficulties, but we're working through them, amen? How many know the song? Okay, good. You still know it? Okay, I'm just checking. <laughs> Makes it a little bit easier to sing it when it has music, amen.
better. sing these true words of this great song. Lord, we, we feel the power of the words as the Spirit bears witness in our heart. What a joy it is. That almost seems impossible to believe, but by faith we do. No fear in life, no fear in death. Lord, what a blessing. What you did for us, the half has never yet been told. And we rejoice with you today that, uh, Lord, the bars of death could not hold you down. And today you live as you rose victorious over it uh, as a daily intercessor for us. And we thank you, Lord, for that. We are in your debt. We love you this morning. We want to worship you in spirit and truth. And uh, we're thankful, Lord, that we are found in Christ alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies. You may be seated. Well, every year we come to this time, and uh, those kids that used to be nuisance running around at our feet, we get to say uh, they're graduating. How in the world did that happen, you know? Uh, and uh, I said to some folks yesterday, we were at a wedding up in uh, Michigan, and I said, uh, we all stay the same, and they get older. I don't know how that happens, but uh, they hardly even recognize them. They're all young adults, and uh, we have a slew of graduates, and Anna comes to introduce them to us. The chairperson of the Board of Christian Ed, and this is the wonderful blessing that I have of my responsibilities to do this. There's a little sarcasm in that. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to do my best to name, every, pronounce everyone's name correctly. So bear with me. Who has the? You ready? Oh, I'm trying to figure out who's doing the clicking. Okay, this is Keller Mark Dorgan. He is the son of Mark and Stephanie Fry Dorgan, and the grandson of Stan, Stan, Stan and the late Shirley Fry. Oh, okay. Oh, I got to do this too? I don't know if I'm going to do this next year. <laughs> um, he is a graduate of South Burlington High School in Vermont. Um, he will be attending the U University of Massachusetts Amherst and a student in Honors College and College of Natural Science. Elijah Egbert, he is the son of John and Sharon Egbert, the grandson of Bill and Sandy White, and the nephew of Rob and Susan Egbert. He graduated from Anna High School and plans to attend Wright State University with his major in statistics. Not me. Ooh. <laughs> Josiah Hutcherson, he is the son of Carl and Michelle Hutcherson and the grandson of Barbara and the late Jim McVetty. He graduated from high school. Um, he was homeschooled through his sophomore year, then he attended Edison Community College, and he intends to complete his final year, or one more year, excuse, excuse me, at Edison, and then he's going to Wright State under the ROTC program. 
Ryan Thomas McCormick. He is the son of Amy and Todd McCormick, the grandson of Polly and the late Ken McCormick. He's graduating from Ben Logan High School and attending the University of Central Florida. Leah Hodge, she's the granddaughter of Lowell and Marilyn Bach, graduating from Olentangy Liberty High School and is attending the University of South Florida and is going to be studying marine biology. Lauren Claire Stangl, the daughter of Jared Stangle and Jody McCorkle Stangle. She is also the granddaughter of Doug and Glenda Stangle, and she graduated from Houston High School. She'll be attending Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, majoring in criminology, and her future plans are to enlist in the U.S. Air Force. That is all of our high school graduates, and now on to college. Kia Nic Nicole Egbert is the daughter of Rob and Susan Egbert, and the granddaughter of Bill and Sandy White, Stan and Sherry Egbert, and the late Paris and Joy Keith. She graduated from the University of Bowling Green with her MBA degree. Lena Grace Stangle is the daughter of Jason and Karen Stangle and the granddaughter of Doug and Glenda Stangle. She graduated from Ohio University in Athens, Ohio and received a Bachelor's of Science in Communications. She is employed with Kimball Midwest in Columbus, Ohio. Ray Tecumseh McCormick, you can tell his dad was a history major, Tecumseh, I love that. Uh, son of Todd and Amy McCormick, the grandson of Polly and the late Ken McCormick, graduating from Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., majoring in international studies. Cody Allen Scott, son of Pam and Dave Scott, grandson of Polly and the late Ken McCormick, graduated from the University of Bowling Green with a major in math education. And our last student, Ryan Hughes, son of Mark and Joan Hughes, graduated from Cedarville University with a Master's of Divinity. Congratulations to all of our graduates. And Ryan, we have a little something for you. Do I get to keep the clicker? <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, he isn't technically graduated yet because he has to pass his last professor's test. Yeah. So I get to hold him that over his head all summer long. Amen. So he's staying with us. And I said, Ryan, our kids need walking. You know, so he has to take kids out walking. Ryan, the hole needs digging. He has to dig the hole. Ryan, the trash needs taken out. He does. Then I say, you're getting closer to this graduate degree. I'm getting ready to <laughs> get it to him. <laughs> Amen. Well, congratulations to all those. Um, you know, we buzzed through those, but uh, comprised with all those different faces, um, that's a lot of work. Larry, you're living it right now. You know how much work that is. And others that are going through school uh, realize that uh, behind those uh, quick words of acknowledgement are a ton of late night studies. And we uh, commend uh, all of our graduates and the families of those graduates. I know that uh, you have to be plenty proud and for good reason you are. Now we have special music. And uh, I always love it when Diane uh, plays any instrument. She does such a great job. God bless you as you come.
plank stand. She did that key, key change, and I thought, I don't know how she's going to get that that high. I was trying to sing up there with her, and that was way out of my, my zone. Thank you so much. What a blessing. And that's a great song. We remember the first time that uh, I was here uh, after Pastor George uh, left, and um, Lisa and her uh, band were playing for that service. And after the service, they played that song. As people were dismissing, I did what I normally do. I walked right out there to the foyer, got ready to shake hands, but nobody came out. And finally, Jo Morlock came out to me, and she said, no one's leaving. <laughs> and uh, they were all in here clapping hands and singing that song. And I think it was uh, one of the most healing things for our church family that day and that song and that moment. And uh, by God's grace, never looked backward other than to say thank you, Lord, for what you've provided for us. And I've always looked forward, and God's been so good as we look around at what God's done in uh, the midst of all those things. We're going to dismiss the kids to junior church. They can make their way out. Bruce, I thought you were going to get to hold him. I was going to say, now I am jealous. You're going to have to preach today. It didn't last. It didn't last. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Oh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bye, buddy. <laughs> you won't let go. <laughs> uh. Uh, well, it won't be long before his name's going to be up there. Yeah, okay, okay. I, I won't say that. Uh, well, one of the great songs uh, that we've sung for years and still is a great song, uh, 345 in your hymn book, if you like to use the hymn book. And um, remember, again, I always say about the hymn book, the reason for the hymn book is ones you can see the words, generally speaking, and also, uh, most importantly, you can see the parts. And if you like to sing the parts, it's beautiful, beautiful uh, to be able to hear them sung um, as we sing this great hymn. Uh, this is one of the songs um, by uh, Fanny Cosby. If you know her, she wrote hundreds of songs. And just a few of them are recorded for us. This is one of them. Blessed Assurance. Stand with me and let's sing together. No part. Sing it out. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior.
singing. You may be seated. Thank you very much. Good to have Stan with us back there in the back. He kind of was stealth coming in here. You might not have seen him, but it's been a few weeks, and it is good to have you back, Stan. And, uh, I know you've gone through some um, troubled waters, and it's nice to know that uh, God never take you through the waters. He won't lead you through the other side, and it is so good to see you here rather than in the hospital, <laughs> amen, and I'm sure it's good to be here rather than be in the hospital as well, but so good to have you back, Stan. A few things fell apart while you were gone, and I'll get you the list, and you can get it fixed, okay? <laughs> amen, amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7, if you have your Bibles today, you'll want to keep it real close because we're going to look in several passages of Scripture, and uh, I was thinking about putting all these Scriptures on the um, overhead so you can see it, but there's just way too many. I still put a lot up there, but uh, if you have your Bibles uh, put it in front of you. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. I'll try to give you time to get to the passages as we mention them. And um, if uh, you find yourself in a position where you don't know the books of the Bible well enough to find it in your Bible, then you need to come in for Sunday school early in the morning and go downstairs to the youth because the youth are learning the books of the Bible. Guess who is in the Sunday school uh, class with the youth? Doug Stangle. They're on vacation this week, but Doug's down there, and he's learning the books of the Bible. So uh, that's, uh, I probably shouldn't say this. I'll get in trouble. I won't say it about, about the dog and the old tricks and new tricks and stuff. But anyway, I won't say that. But uh, you, you can always learn, and it's wonderful if you know the books of the Bible, then you can kind of get there a little bit quicker. If you don't know it, nothing shameful about that. You got to learn everything, right? Had to learn how to breathe. Only thing I don't think I ever had to do is learn to eat and cry. Uh, and other things, but uh, those things you had to learn, so there's nothing shameful about learning the books of the Bible. If you do it, you'll be blessed from it, and you'll be able to open the Bible to where you want. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, real simple, and it's a parenthesis. It means it's in between a, a, another bigger story and just this parenthesis in it. We're just going to focus on the parenthesis this morning, and notice what it says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. In this passage of Scripture, Paul reiterates a common message that he often wrote about and an imperative in the Christian life, and that is simply that we're to walk by faith and not by sight. This familiar phrase will be our theme for the next several weeks. I think it's eight weeks. Uh, as we examine the life of one of God's choice servants. And um, I, his name's mentioned in another place of the Bible, Romans chapter 4. And you may want to turn there. It's not too far to the left of where you are. Romans chapter 4. It's just so nice, much nicer to see it actually in your Bible than to just see it on uh, paper or even on the screen. But Romans chapter 4, your notes say uh, verse 11, but that was a typographical error on my part. It should be 12. And so Romans chapter 4 and verse number 12, this is what God's Word says. And the father of circumcision, when the Bible speaks of circumcision, always speaking of the Jew. And so I put it in uh, uh, marks there on the overhead so you can see that. And there are only three classes in the Bible, Jew, Gentile, and church. Those are the only ethnic groups in the Bible, just three. So when the Bible speaks about Jews, it's either Jew or not Jew. And when it's not Jew, it's always a reference to Gentiles, all right? So here he says, and the father of circumcision, 
the father of the Jews, to them who are not of the circumcision only, but, and this is the other, Gentiles who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father, and then it gives us his name. What's his name? Let's say it aloud together. Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. So he's saying that Paul is telling us that Abraham represents in the Bible the father of faith, the father of faith. Abraham is rightly known as the father of all who believe or the father of faith. About 1,800 years before Christ, okay, if you go backwards in time, 1,400 years before Christ, and after the chaos of Babel, I, I circled it on that picture that's up on the overhead so that you can see that's the Tower of Babel. So 1,800 years before Christ and right after the event, uh, the chaos uh, that uh, existed at the Tower of Babel, and before there were even what we know today as Jews, a man by the former name of Abram, and I will mess that up. I'm going to say Abram and Abraham And you're going to say, are those two different people? No, it's one and the same. His name was Abram to begin with. And then later in his life, his name was changed to Abraham. But you try to keep that straight while you're going through notes and preaching. It's a mess. So if I say Abraham, I mean Abram. And if I say Abram, I mean Abram. No, never mind. Anyway, so uh, one and the same, same person. His name was just lengthened later in his life. All right. But Abraham received a call from God to settle in a new land and build a great nation and to be a personal blessing to all the families of the earth. That second circle, you probably can't see it where you're from where you're sitting, but is Abraham. Right after the Tower of Babel, about 1,800 years before Christ was born, Abraham shows up on the scene. Now, Abraham came from a well-known family. Um, His father, whose name is Terah, held a unique and a distinguished place in the Jewish genealogy. His father, uh, Abram's father, Terah, though an idol worshiper, according to Joshua chapter 24 and verse 2, we often think of Abraham as a person of faith, so his dad must have been a person of faith, and that's not true. His dad was uh, uh, an idolatrist. He worshiped idols. He didn't believe in the Lord God. So Terah begins this family, but he's an idol worshiper. And he starts this long track. This is a map of uh, the Middle East, Mediterranean Sea. You kind of see that. And see the big thick arrow on your screen? It's a circle around a little town called Ur of the Chaldeans. And Terah started from down there, uh, along with Abraham and the rest of his family, and they moved northward, if you see the arrow there, to the next circle, about a thousand-year track from Ur the Chaldees to Canaan. And this is given to us in the chapter before what we're going to look today in Genesis chapter 12. But, But Haran died 400 miles from the destination. He traveled northward to Hera, Haran, at the top circle, and his desire was to come down on the left there to Canaan, but he died up in Haran. Now, this has nothing to do with the message today, but if you've ever heard of the Crescent, uh, that's the area right there. If you've ever heard of the Holy Land, that's it right there. And if you've ever studied your Bible, when God gave Adam the coordinates of the land of Eden, not the Garden of Eden, but the land of Eden, it's the same coordinates. That triangle represented by those round circles and those lines are the most treasured pieces of dirt on the earth because God gave that to the nation of Israel. And everybody wants it. Every war that we've ever had has been centered on that little triangle right there. Even if it was in another land, 
it was centered on who gets to control that land right there. Every skirmish that we read about today is over that land right there. It has nothing to do with Ukraine or Russia. It's about that land right there. Everything is about that land because God gave that land to Abraham. And nobody wants Abraham to have that land. This is interesting. If uh, you've been in our Wednesday night program uh, Bible study, and you can get them on YouTube, uh, you'll see that land has a history to it. And it's more than just circles and lines on a map. But there's a lot of history to that land right there. Everything in the Old Testament happened in that triangle right there. Isn't that something? All the Old Testament in that triangle right there. So it's a contested piece of property. It's always been contested piece of property. And it will be a contested piece of property until the king of kings comes down to this earth and puts his feet on that soil and said, it's mine. And every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. <laughs> and they'll say, it is yours. But that's the contested land right there. Now that was a commercial. That had nothing to do with the message. I just thought I'd throw that in so that you can enjoy it with me. So back to Terah. Uh, uh, he's Abram's dad. And he makes his truck up there. He dies in Haran. All right. And th this often confuses people because Abraham had a brother, Nahor, and he also had a brother, Haran. And a lot of people think that that's related to the land up there. But there's no connection between them at all. Same name. But one's of a person, one's of a place. So Haran, they make it up there. And Terah dies up there in that northern circle on the map. And uh, never made it to his destination. Now after Abram's father died, uh, Abram was with his wife Sarah. And his nephew Lot, when he heard God's voice to him. And this was the beginning of his spiritual journey. It's recorded for us in Genesis chapter 12. And I invite you to turn with me there in your Bible. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. While you're turning there. We're going to study the beginning of this series of eight sermons. On starting right. While you're finding that passage, let me tell you a little bit. Genesis chapter 12. Chinese proverb says a good beginning is half the job done. You have to process that for a while to understand what that means. A good beginning is half the job done. Robert Fulgham, in his book, All I Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, wrote the principles he learned. Share everything, play fair, don't hit people, put things back where you found them. My kids never learned that part. Um, uh, clean up your, oh, that matter of fact, that, there's a lot in here that they didn't learn. Clean up your mess, don't take things that aren't yours, and say sorry when you've hurt somebody. Pretty good advice, amen. Uh, what a way to start uh, your children's life. Everyone wants to start right. Everyone wants to start right. Whether it's a new job, a new family, a new year, or even a new believer, we all want to start right. But how in the world do we ensure our beginning will be right, that we will indeed start right? What should we do to start right? The answers to these are given to us in Genesis chapter 12. And if you found it in your Bible, we're going to look at those verses as we move through the sermon today. So keep it open there if you would. And what is it that this beginning of Abraham's life or Abram's life in the text, what is it that it teaches to us about starting right? Well, first of all, what it teaches us is to trust in the Lord. Now, I know this is going to be like, I've never heard that before, okay? No, uh, you've heard this a hundred times, but it bears repeating. If you want to start right in your life, in whatever it is, Let's say you're here today, and you know that there are some things in your life, if you had a could, you'd start all over on. Then start today. And I'm going to give you three points that will help you to start right. Maybe you're in a relationship, and you want to make sure that it's right. I'm going to give you three points to make sure that that relationship starts right. Maybe you're uh, already in the relationship. You're married, and you've had some difficulties. 
none of us have ever had any difficulty, so you're really weird that you have them. All right, Brenda's not here. <laughs> she would be assaulting the pulpit right now, okay? Everybody has problems. Everybody has problems. There are people that don't work at those problems that fail, and there are people that live their whole life working towards those problems, always have them, and are successful. You say, how in the world do I get started? I start right now. I'm going to give you three points that will help you. Any endeavor, starting a new job, young, some of you young people are going to be going out in the workforce, and uh, not all of them will be as good of an employer as you have right now, Maddox. You know, he's a really nice one. He's digging a pool for me, so I've got to be nice. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> but not everybody's going to be a Christian that you work for. And you say, how in the world am I going to start right on that job? I'm going to give you three points today that will help you. Number one, from the life of Abraham, trust in the Lord. Now, we, we get this from reading the first four verses of Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to read it. You follow along in your Bible or on the screen. It says, now the Lord had said unto Abram. A lot of folks say, did Abram get the call from God when he's in Haran? Or did he get the call from God when he's Ur? The Bible doesn't specifically say, but the fact that it says, now the Lord had said unto Abram, I'm kind of thinking that he had this motivation of God's word to him before he left Ur of the Chaldees, which was his home. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed and did, excuse me, and as the Lord had spoken to him. So, Maddox, I'm going to use you as an example today. I hope you don't get mad at me because you're bigger than me. All right. But uh, so it'd be like your mom and dad turn around to you after the service today and say, Maddox, I want you to pack everything at home. I want you to get your girlfriend, go see the preacher, get married. I'm sorry. I mean, just, you know, okay. It's a make-believe story, but, you know. And, and then I want you to get in the car and I want you to take off. I want you to get away from all your family. I want you to get away from Sydney. I want you to get away from everything you know, everything dear to you. I want you to go everywhere. I'm not going to give you any money. I'm not going to give you anything to help you. I want you to just get out and go. Now, if I was your age, that would sound pretty exciting, okay? But about 200 miles down the road or 250, however many gallons of gas till your car is empty, then all of a sudden the reality sits in that I am on the side of the interstate with no gas, no money, the responsibility of someone sitting next to me, and I really don't know what to do. I'm in a land where I don't even know, hey, uh, Uncle Joe, can you help me? Do you have an Uncle Joe? No, okay. Uncle J Pete? No, okay. <laughs> but there's no one to call. I mean, you're just out there on your own. So this is what God told Abram to do. Get away from your country from your kindred from your father's house and go to a land that I'll show thee which direction oh just head that direction where am I going I'll tell you when you get there I mean that's not everybody would take that offer but notice the last part of the verse what's it say so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him I want to just tell you the Bible is a really practical book. Sometimes when we read it, we make it like supermen and superwomen, but they're people just like you and me. There are in very many people in this room today, including myself, that would ever take that and go, okay, you'd have to be a person of great faith to follow that command. And if God promised Abraham, as you look down through here, God promised Abraham a great land, a great nation, a great name, and the whole earth was going to be blessed because of him if he obeyed him. I mean, that's a lot of promises from the Lord to him just to be obedient. And it took a great deal of faith for Abraham to respond to these promises because 
God said, I'm going to make you a great land, a great name, and a, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. And uh, Abraham's about 100 years old. Sarah's about 90 years old. And they're looking at one another and saying, how in the world are we going to even have a family? We don't have any children. 100 years old and 90 years old. So beyond the fact of a young Matic, are you 18, 17, 16, somewhere in that? Okay. So you take that command that I said, get out, go. Now imagine, oh, don't work on this too hard. That you're 100 years old. And your girlfriend's 90. Oh, my, that's something, isn't it? Okay. And your kid, your, your mom and dad say, now I want you to take off Maddox. And God's going to create the whole universe blessed by your children. You're 100 and she's 90. And you still pack your bags and you still go. That's faith. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's faith. The Bible said that Sarah had passed the time in her life where she could bear children. And yet they just took off. If you and I want to start our life right, it does not start by calculating the risks and the opportunities. It starts by saying, God, whatever you say, I'm going to trust you, even though it doesn't make any sense to me. And I'm going to do what you tell me to do. I'm going to trust in the Lord. This is kind of interesting. The same verse that we read, but look up, if you would, at the screen and notice all the I wills. One, two, three, four times in that short passage, God saying, this is what I will do. This is what I will do. This is what I will do. You see, we look at life differently. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to be honest. Okay, this is how I look at it. I, maybe that's easier. Is I don't, I don't often calculate God I wills. I calculate my I wills. Are y'all with me? I, I, I like to think in terms of what I think I can do, not what God can do. And see, what I can do is the opposite of faith. When we think of what God can do, that's when we exercise our faith. And God has this thing about putting something out there that doesn't seem attainable and saying, go ahead and do it. Do you remember Peter on the boat? Oh, come on out. I mean, do you, have you ever lived the stories? Can you imagine what it was like to even entertain taking your leg and throwing it over the, the side of that boat to get out of that boat? Who would ever do that? But he throws his leg over there, comes out, and he puts, you know, this little thing here like, is, is it, really? But that's what God does. He asks us to do something that we say, I don't think that's possible. And God said, that's exactly where I want you because it's not with you, but all things are possible with me. And I want you to trust me. If I made it where you could do it, you would never know if it was you or me. But if I make it to where you could never do it and only I can do it, then you'll get at the end of it and you'll go, praise the Lord, only he could have done that. Trust the Lord. God would do it all if only Abraham would trust and believe in him. And the Bible says God believe, uh, Abraham believed God and he counted it to him for righteousness. How in the world do we know if Abraham really did believe? Well, look at the evidence of his belief. It's threefold in the passage. First of all, here's what it says. Uh, now the Lord said unto Abraham, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house and the land that I'll show thee. Uh, and that's what Abraham did. He forsook everything, verse 1. Abraham left wealthy Ur of the Chaldeans, wealthy Haran, which was centrally located and rich in learning. He also left his relatives, his family, uh, familiar surroundings, and he settled a way of life outside. He, he took off. He forsook everything. But not only do we know that Abraham trusted in the Lord because he forsook everything, but he also remained fearless. 
When God ultimately told him where he wanted him to go, in verse 5, Abraham took Sarah's wife and Lot his brother's son and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls of them that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. Now, you may not know this if you're not real familiar with biblical times, but uh, the Canaanites were not real, they, they were they not real neighborly <laughs> when it came to Jewish people. They, they're like oil and water. They didn't get together. They seem to be intimidated by the social and the economic status of Shem's descendants, of which Abraham was one of them. And nothing has changed. Even today, it's the same way. Do you all, you all hear about when someone makes a really good deal? <clears throat> they'll, they'll say, did you Jew them? See, that's a figure of speech that now is woke. You're not allowed to say that anymore, and I just did. But to use it as an illustration, the idea is, is that the whole world is jealous of the nation of the Israel, the Shemites, because God promised that he would bless them, and they blessed them, and the whole world is upset with them because of that. Wars have been fought over that to try to extinguish those people. And so, God said to Abraham, I, I not only want you to take off like I asked Maddox to do, imagine that, but he said, I want you to go, I'm going to give you so many kids that they're like the stars of the heaven, you're 100 years old and Sarah's 90, but trust me, you're going to have that many kids, and I want you to start your family over on the other side of the city where it isn't real favorable to live. That's what God said to Abraham. And he remained fearless, the Bible says, and into the land of Canaan they came. Trust in the Lord. And we show, he showed the evidence of his trust by forsaking everything, remaining fearless, and thirdly, by following the Lord. All right, so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. Abraham followed the Lord, content that God would provide he walked away from everything tangible and into a hostile, hostile territory obediently. And as we look back now over the obedience of Abram in the text, we see God has given Israel a land. They'll get more. The Jews have been blessed, uh, and they've blessed all nations as well. They've blessed us by giving us a Bible. They've blessed us by giving Jesus Christ to us, who was a Jew. Uh, we have been blessed Abraham's name is revered by Jews and by Christians and by Muslims and even unbelievers because in him were all the families of the earth blessed. And so if you want to start right, no matter what it is that you're trying to do, the first thing you have to do is trust in the Lord. The second thing you need to do is testify to others. Look at verse 7 and 8 if you still have Genesis open there, Genesis chapter 12. It says, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed I will give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east side of Bethel, pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. I, I, we don't have time this morning because I spent so much time in the introduction. But... In your notes, I put several references, but there's many more than this. Notice I put etc. there in the notes because there's many more than what I listed. But everywhere that Abraham went, he built an altar. Now, an altar in the Bible was they would take stones and they'd pile these stones up. It could be this high or it could be this high. And they'd put these pile of stones. When a person would walk by there, they'd say those stones didn't get there like, you know, through the air. <laughs> Someone moved them there. And people would say, I wonder who did that and what for. And so everywhere that Abraham traveled, he built these altars. And what was the purpose for these altars? Well, there's many. One of them was just according to Genesis chapter 13, verse 2 and 4, a personal marker, a testimony to himself. Um, <clears throat> on our walls and probably in the walls of your house, when your kids get in sports, you're going to have these pictures on the refrigerator or on the walls. And when you come by them, 
like uh, I have pictures of Andrew um, breaking something. Uh, what sport were you with? Uh, breaking something. He's never stopped. And uh, uh, then there's John. He's a runner. Amen. And that's the first time I said, if I get my hands on you, and he's been running ever since. And, uh, and then there's Titus, okay? And I'm not real sure about Titus yet, uh, but he's got his issues too. But anyway, uh, these guys, I've got these pictures on the refrigerator and on the walls and, and everywhere. And every time I, y'all live with me here for a minute. Every time I walk by them, I go, oh. Uh, and if I don't have them on the wall, you, my phone, I have three messages there from iCloud. You have used up all of your memory, okay? I got six zillion pictures of these kids doing those things. And they're personal markers of the achievements of their life. That I go back there. Are you with me, Hillary? And I just visit them. They're wonderful personal testimonies of their lives. One of the reasons that people set up altars in the Old Testament, Abraham specifically, is for a personal testimony. He said, I'm going to walk by here again sometime, and I want to remember this moment. And so they'd pile up these stones. And when you come by, you go, I, re I remember when I picked each one of those stones up. Personal markers, a testimony to himself. But not only that, personal witness markers. In Genesis chapter 28, verses uh, 10 through 18, or excuse me, I'm ahead of myself there. Personal witness markers are a testimony to others. So people would come by these altars built up and they'd say, who built that and for what purpose? And no one can pile up stones, kindle a fire on them, and then offer a sacrifice upon it without stirring up some attention. What's he doing? What would be the standard question? So one of the reasons that he piled these stones up is so that other people would know that he was honoring his God. And then thirdly, and that's the Genesis 28 passage, and that's a practical whereabouts markers, a testimony to his family. This is kind of interesting. If you don't know the story, you're not going to follow what I'm getting ready to say. But in Genesis chapter 28, right where Abraham set up his first altar, and I put it into parentheses there. You see Abraham, then Isaac, and Jacob. Nearly a hundred years later, Jacob comes by the same place that Abram had piled up these stones, and he's traveling from Beersheba going towards where of all places? Haran. That's the top circle that we looked at in the map. And he lighted upon a certain place. He just kind of fell into this place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and he put them for his pillow and lay down in that place to sleep. How many of you know the passage? If you've taught Sunday school, you know it. This is Jacob's ladder. He falls asleep and he has this dream and this ladder comes down from heaven. And, uh, and when he wakes up, he said, I've seen the face of God. I'm going to call the name of this place Bethel. Which guess who had already called that place the name Bethel? Abraham, about a hundred years earlier, who had piled up stones in the place that now Jacob, his grandson, was laying on for his pillow. Those same stones are the one that Jacob said, this is the house of God right here. Because I've seen God's face. So they were a testimony to his family as well. Each one of these altars, a testimony to himself, a testimony to uh, the world around them, and also a testimony to his family. And Abraham set these altars up all over the place. And you know what these altars were telling him? These altars were telling him and others that he had faith in God. One of the most important steps in starting right, no matter where you are or what you're doing, is a bold testimony of your faith in Christ Jesus. I know you may be timid. It may seem like it's the last thing in the world you want to do. You may be intimidated beyond belief. But the best thing you can do anytime you start anything is to make sure that your testimony for Jesus Christ is known. Get it done. Get it out of the way. I've told you this before. I don't mean to bore you, but I just want to tell you this is intentional. Every time I have an appointment with someone about financial planning or insurance or something like that, I always start the conversation this way. 
I'm faith-based. I don't know what that means to you, but what it means to me is that I'm not going to lie to you because i got to give an answer to someone bigger than you and me, and I want to do it with joy and not with sorrow. And they'll look at you like, a, like, like this, and they'll ask one of two questions. Like, oh, they have no clue what I just said. Or they'll say, oh, really, what church do you go to? And they know what I said, uh, one or two ways. But that starts the whole conversation completely different. I was not schooled to do that. In fact, I was schooled not to do that. Money, politics, and religion, you can't do that. And I said, I, I break all three rules. Amen? Uh, I, I just think starting right, there's no sense in not. And I just start, I lay the, and I have probably... I'm sure that, Dave, you know something about this and some others that are in the insurance business understand. I have the largest client base because these people don't know me as their insurance agent or their financial planner. They know me as their Christian brother in Christ. What a relationship. And so I say, anything you do, whatever it is, the first thing you do is trust in the Lord. I, I was told if I ever started the conversation that way, that was over. It would be over with. My first year in insurance sales, I was the number one person in the nation. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying, I trusted the Lord. I didn't listen to what they had to say. There's a people out there that are more afraid of crooks than they are of people that have faith. And when I identified I was the faith person and not the crook person, they were a little apprehensive, but not as much as the first, okay? Because, you know, the only ones worse than crooks are preachers. All right, so at any rate, Start right. It doesn't matter what you're starting. Start right. Trust the Lord and then give a testimony. Tell them whose side you're on from the get-go. Uh, for those of you that work outside the home, most men, but women as well, start right. Testify of your God. Put an altar up. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. I did it by putting a Bible on the desk that they gave me. I put a Bible right there on the corner, one of them thick ones, not quite a family when it was real close to a family. I didn't want one of those little New Testaments that's on a chip, you know. I want, and I put it right out there, leather bound, gold all over the place. I wanted it to catch their eye because they'd come up and they'd go, oh, are you religious? First question they'd ask. I said, no, no, no. Oh, no, I'm not religious. And then they look at you like, I don't know what to do with you. And he said, well, what are you? I said, I'm a Christian. Religion will take you to hell. But Christ is our only hope. And they'd go, oh, okay. <laughs> like, how, where's the exit sign? Let me get out of here, amen. But start right. Start right. Have a testimony. You don't have to be bull in a china closet, but have a testimony. Don't be afraid to identify who you are. If you want to start right, trust in the Lord. Testify of his name. And then thirdly, tell the truth. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Verse 10 through 13, there was a famine in the land. Abram went down into Egypt, sojourned there, and the famine was grievous in the land. It came to pass when he come near to the entering into Egypt that he said unto Sarah his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, they shall say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee a lie. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister. You know what he said? He said, I want you, I got an amen, amen, that's good to get amen. He said, I, Sarah, I want you to tell an untruth and say that you're my sister. If you want to start right, you tell the truth. Don't follow Abram's example. Tell the truth. Now, there's so many things here, but we're out of time. Let me just say that I read this book, that a day, The Day America Told the Truth, and it has some statistics, and I put it in the notes. 91% of those surveyed lied routinely about matters they considered trivial. 36% lie about important matters. 80% lie regularly to parents. Are my kids in here? And, uh, and there are all sorts of statistics. I'll let you read them for yourself. America and human beings have a problem with lying. It's hard for us to tell the truth. 
And Abraham had a trouble telling the truth. In fact, this sixth sister act, she is my sister, occurred twice in Abraham's life here in uh, Genesis chapter 12 and also in Genesis chapter 20, verse 2. Twice he tried to pawn her off as his sister. Now, this is kind of interesting because Sarah was a half-sister. They shared the same dad, but a different mom. So Sarah was his half-sister, but what, not fully his sister. And so when he made this, technically he was correct. In truth, she was his sister from a different mother. Genesis chapter 20 and verse 12 tells you that. Sarah was not only Abram's sister, but also his wife. So Abraham tell this mistruth was legally inaccurate, and it was morally wrong. It was much more than a sister. And so don't follow his example. Tell the truth. Why did Abraham, the father of faith, succumb to such deception, you may ask? Three quick reasons. Number one, he was in the wrong place. Genesis chapter 12, verse 10, and there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went, what's the next word? Down into Egypt. <laughs> the devil takes you down. God always takes you up. Egypt in the Bible is a picture or a type of the world. When we make a decision to go back into the world, that's not a positive thing. That's a bad thing. And Abraham made a decision when he saw the famine in the land, I'm not going to be able to handle this and feed my family, so I need to go down to Egypt where there is it's more fertile and it's closer to the water. One of the things that he did is he was in the wrong place. He chose the easy way out. Instead of trusting the Lord in the land of Canaan, he panicked and took shelter in Egypt, a type of the world. Secondly, he had a wrong purpose. This is found in verse 13. I've always laughed every time I read through there. I don't know how many times I've read this passage, but I always laugh. He said to Sarah, whispered in her ear, Sarah, I pray thee, tell them that thou art my sister, that it may be well with who? Me. He really wasn't too interested in Sarah. He was interested in him. He had the wrong purpose. The reason that he lied is because he was trying to protect his own neck. And not only did he have in the wrong place and have the wrong purpose, but notice his perception was wrong. Genesis 12, 12. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee that they shall say, this is his wife, and they will kill me. A wrong perception. He mistakenly thought his survival depended upon him. So if you're going to trust the Lord, you can't take matters into your own hands. If you're going to trust the Lord, you lean not in your own understanding, but in all your ways you acknowledge him. Say, God, I don't see that it's possible. And that makes me energized because you never asked me to do things that are possible. Because if I can do things that are possible, I can do it. But you're asking me to do something that seems impossible. And I know that that means you're behind it. And because you're behind it, it's your responsibility to do that. Trust in the Lord testify to others, tell the truth. In order to start right, whatever the issue may be, these are the three proven steps Abraham exampled for us. Trust the Lord, testify to others, and tell the truth. Now, it may seem simplistic to you, no matter what it is that you're starting, if you start with those three points, you'll be successful at what you do. I've been in some environments uh, where it was kind of scary. If you're in the construction business or you've been around the construction business, uh, they only know four words. I can't repeat any of them. And they, they, they're all about masculinity. And the rite of passage is how big is your bicep. So I got three out of two, or two out of three, I know. Uh, but into that environment, I walked with the Bible under my arm and Christ in my heart with a discern, desire to trust in the Lord, to testify of others, and to tell the truth. 
and you don't have enough time to listen to the stories that I could tell of what God did. Amazing stories. There isn't anything in my life that I could ever attest failure to that I've used those three points to begin with. Now, I've not always been strong. None of us are. And there are other times when I leaned in my own understanding and I did my own manipulation and I tried to do it my way and it fell apart. But if you start any endeavor with first saying, God, I know this is what you want me to do and I'm going to do it with all my heart. And two, don't be ashamed of Jesus. Testify and then be honest. That's important. Dave, I know, is in business and <clears throat> others in here may be. But I'm sure that you could say yes to this and testify. I don't mind if someone tells me no, if they can't do something. But it really bothers me if they say yes, but they don't do it. No one wants someone to lie to them. Start right. Trust the Lord. Testify to others and tell the truth. I pray God will grant you the fortitude to follow this well-traveled path to great success. <clears throat> Today we spend a time to celebrate our connectedness together through the Lord Jesus Christ as we come and partake of the elements as commanded by God <clears throat> in the book of 1 Corinthians. Paul said here in this great passage of Scripture, um, I delivered unto you that which also I received, how that the Lord Jesus, uh, after he had broken the bread, said, Take thee, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death till he come. And um, he said, as often as you do it. We do it once a month. It's a great time. I always enjoy it because it allows us the opportunity as a church family uh, to experience the memory of looking back at what Jesus did for us all together. It also gives us an opportunity because Paul said, before you do this, um, you should examine yourself. <laughs> and uh, it always gives us that wonderful opportunity to have time of prayer beforehand and say, Lord, if there's any, any rebellion in my heart, remove it right now. Shouldn't be any reason why a Christian doesn't participate in the Lord's Supper unless you just don't want to. God always give us a way out to be honest with him. And nobody in here is perfect. Amen. All of us are sinners. What he wants us to confess is an open rebelliousness in our heart. He doesn't want us to eat or drink unworthily. So open rebellion would be the only reason why he wouldn't eat or drink. I hope that's not you. I don't think anybody here is like that. But he said, Let's, let a man examine himself and then let him eat. After he examines himself, then let him eat. Those that you think here this morning that are the least worthy are probably the most. And those that you would estimate would be the most worthy are probably the least. We're all in the same bucket. We're not worthy because of us. We're worthy because of him. And so let's take a moment to uh, open our hearts to confess before the Lord. And then after a moment of silence, uh, we will pray for the cup and for the bread. And then we will do as we've been doing in this post-COVID uh, world. It will allow you to come up and get your own. They're double stacked. They have the bread in the bottom and the juice in the top. And then go back to your seat. But let's pray. Father, thank you for the great sacrifice you made for us. We're made aware of it often, but most of the time when we look in the mirror and we see ourselves for what we truly are, and we realize only the love of God could look beyond all of that and still to go to the cross and die. Thank you, Lord, for loving us that much. And as we partake of these elements today and we look back at that great sacrifice, help us to rededicate our hearts to love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll dismiss row by row, and we'll start here in the front row and come up. If you're here and you cannot, uh, your mobility won't allow you to get one, Jerry would be happy to bring one to you. 
or you can snag a neighbor next to you and they'll probably do it for you as well. But let's start right here in the front. The Bible says when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take heed, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it. In remembrance of me. One day, it won't be here, but we'll join the Lord in heaven and we'll sit down a feast. And it won't be a pastor that talks about the elements, it'll be about the Lord Himself. And uh, what a day that will be. And one of the things that holds us together until that day comes is blessed be the tie that binds. Let's stand and sing, make a big circle. You have a private circle. That's pretty neat. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let's sing together. 
bless you. Have a great afternoon and a great week in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Testify to others and do right.